when Reprieg had arrived at his destination, he had already been too late. The target and his monster friend had already been taken away in order to have some words with the captain himself. A crowd of engineers and mechanics was hurrying in and out of the cabin in their stead, filling the entire corridor and causing a major stir-up with the other crew members residing in the same hallway. After talking to some of them, Reprieg did have to reluctantly admire his target in a weird way. The human had not damaged the computer terminal in his room, he had utterly decimated it. Reprieg had even been able to personally take a look at the damages. The metal object that had been flung into it had smashed through the screen and was now lodged in the wall, not even the half of it sticking out anymore. This made repairs difficult to say the least. The team on board was more than prepared to repair any of the usual damages that were to be expected within the systems within the moment's notice and even bigger failures usually would be repairable, given enough time. However, this terminal didn't need to be repaired. It needed to be replaced. Reprieg didn't even know if they had entire replacement terminals on board. After observing the engineers at their work, alongside Reprieg was, to his great dismay, the abomination. Its metal frame had taken position by the wall opposite of the screen, and stayed almost completely unmoving, while his cold, red eyes carefully watched every bit of work that was performed in the target's room. Reprieg could see that he was not the only one being disconcerted by his presence, as every crew member tried their best to keep their distance, and their gaze, as far away from it as possible. However, to him, his presence presented more than an irritation. With its synthetic eyes constantly monitoring the room, it presented what was pretty much a living surveillance system, keeping the room under lockdown for everything it didn't approve of. He found that out first hand, when he tried to inconspicuously place a little contingency within the target's room. It was a very small, unassuming gadget he picked up from Tessiel on his way here, and would serve as a temporary replacement for the camera of the computer terminal. However, when he tried to leave afterwards, he was suddenly stopped in his tracks, when he felt the touch of something cold from behind, immediately making the hairs of his entire body stand up, and sending a feeling like a thousand bugs were crawling through his fur over his skin. He jumped away from the touch, shooting around to face whatever just made contact with him. And there he stood, his dead metal eyes on him, one of those disgusting unnatural claws still raised up from when it had put it on his skin. He could feel bile rising up within him, just thinking about it. What do you think you're doing? He exclaimed in his visceral reaction, excessively rubbing his hand over the parts of his fur still tingling from the unwanted contact. He couldn't help but nervously lick his trunk over and over again, as he felt it was the only thing keeping his earlier meal inside of his stomach. You forgot this, the abomination answered tonelessly, its unnatural synthetic voice sending additional showers down Reprieve's back. With that, his appendage turned slightly, revealing that, on his other side, it was holding onto the device Reprieve had just carefully placed with some kind of tube. Most likely he should have protested somehow, make sure that the device stayed in the room as intended, and if necessary, confront the abominable being. But he couldn't. Just being in the presence of that thing was enough to send him into hysteria. And as much as it didn't fit his position, and no matter how little he wanted to admit it, he would have done just about anything to make his interaction with it as short as at all possible. So with his fingers stretched out as far as he could, he slowly took the device from it, being very careful not to accidentally touch the metal surface of his body again before immediately turning around on his heels and basically fleeing out of the cabin, only coming to a stop some paces away from the door. While that did deal a huge blow to his pride, he told himself that it would be better if he tried again another time, when things would have calmed down and he could remain unobserved. He caught his breath for a moment, looking down at the device in his hand. It was a grey metal tube with no real identifying features. He would have to find its use some other time now. He didn't even want to think about the kind of ridicule this would get him from his colleagues, not to mention actual consequences that might happen, if he couldn't ensure the continued surveillance of the target any time soon. Therefore, to escape those thoughts, he decided that his talents would most likely be needed in a different part of the ship soon, seeing as he had seen the freak's assistant still laying around in his room. And the captain most likely wouldn't be chewing the two of them out for much longer, so Reprieg felt like he might as well get a head start on what was guaranteed, to be his next assignment. Anything to get as far away from that thing as possible. However, things turned out to be a bit more complicated than when, days later, he wasn't a step closer to solving the problem. 
At least if I ever need to clear a room near instantly, I now know who to ask. Reprieve thought to himself, while peeking through the large doorway leading to the ship's designated fitness area. It was a big, open room, filled with many pieces of equipment that could be used for maintaining one's personal physical shape, and able to accommodate a large number and variety of people at a time, making it, usually, quite popular amongst many of the crew members. Reprieve himself often spent a bit of his precious free time here, to keep his underutilized muscles occupied while on board. However, he had never ever seen it anywhere close to as empty as in the last few days, which might have had something to do with him also never seeing either the human or the Miat use it before. But after they had now been both completely banned from doing any exercise anywhere else within the ship, by the captain himself no less, they had apparently run out of options. So now, perhaps out of spite, they had immediately taken up a new, extravagant training routine. Within it, instead of doing any sensible exercise, they had decided to strap weights in form of what looked like protectors and some sort of aprons onto themselves, which apparently was something they had just lying around, and then physically competed with each other in a myriad of ways. And today, among their disciples of choice, sparring was at the top. It was remarkable how quickly people decided that the training wasn't really that necessary today, once two high-class death worlders decided to go at each other in their general vicinity. This made things harder for Reprieg, who, sans a crowd to disappear in, was quickly running out of hiding spots, and therefore was now basically glued to the doorframe, stuck as the sole observer of the barbaric spectacle everyone else was fleeing from. Although the two of them did at least have the foresight to prevent themselves from seriously injuring each other, Reprieg had to admit that much. The Miet had put on thick, very cut-resistant gloves, keeping her from filleting her opponent, while the human was wearing something that looked like padded mittens, seemingly tailor-made to cushion his hammer-like blows. Besides that, however, they weren't holding anything back, at least from what Reprie could tell. As he kept watching them, and without realising it, his thoughts and attention underwent a curious shift. In the beginning, he had looked upon the display with the same content he always felt when his fellows in destination felt the need to step out of line, and pondered what a waste of time it was to have to watch them in a place like this. There were perfectly functional terminals in the room, after all, but apparently they weren't enough to serve as a satisfactory surveillance for the entire large area. He figured at least this would give him time to think about the bigger problem he had at the moment. Apparently, while not seeming at all concerned about his own well-being and health, the human was very protective of his personal belongings, and had therefore taken to keeping his cabin locked at all times it wasn't somehow in use. Of course, it would have been child's play to remotely unlock it and place the device inside the supposedly locked room, leaving the freak none the wiser. But after discussing the idea with his colleagues, he was overruled, as they warned him to be careful. The human certainly was attentive, even if he didn't show it all the time. If the slightest thing was out of place after a preak left, there was a chance that he would discover the gadget, even if it was hidden. And an unknown device, inconspicuous as it may be, suddenly popping up in a room that had presumably been locked would certainly raise his suspicions. Not to mention that he would certainly show it to the patchwork pack he had been building since entering the crew, which included the Abomination, who knew the device to be connected to Reprieg. A little overcautious, found Reprieg, but he was pretty much alone with that stance. So he was forced to keep trying and failing to find an alternative that would allow him to finally complete his task, all the while his eyes stayed on the event in front of his eyes. And the more his frustration with the situation grew, the less he found himself concentrating on his mission, and the more he found himself focusing on the sheer display of power and skill happening between the two. More and more he noticed that, while their physique would most likely allow them to win many fights with their natural abilities alone, they were in no way just wildly brawling like he would expect from someone of their nature. He could see it. While some of their movements were too fast for him to completely follow at this distance, he could tell that they were very deliberate and even more precise. The longer he paid attention to it, the more he also could observe the match evolve in front of his very eyes. In the beginning, the Miat had clearly held the upper hand. Her stance was low and wide, allowing her to quickly burst forward in quick rushes and swipe at her opponent, while also keeping her low and agile enough to avoid any incoming counters by twisting her body out of the way. She knew fully well of the advantage her natural weapons would give her in a real fight, since they allowed her to not have to fully commit to her attacks and still theoretically deal a good amount of damage with any seemingly light hits she landed. She also seemed to be a lot more flexible in the movement of her upper body than a human, giving her more options regarding the angle she could attack from after having to reposition. Last but not least, she seemed to blatantly have the advantage in speed at first. 
All of this pushed the human entirely into the defensive. However, he wasn't completely outmatched in any sense of the imagination. His stance was tighter, with his legs about shoulder wide and his feet orientated at an angle to each other. He didn't move in bursts like his opponent, but rather constantly made small steps to adjust his position, while only moving minimally otherwise. His every move seemed to revolve entirely around his centre of gravity, which allowed him to weave and dodge near instantaneously, while almost not affecting his balance. Whatever attacks he couldn't dodge, he was quick to block or swipe away with his raised arms, constantly protecting his face while idle. But even with this admittedly impressive defence he presented, Rapik wasn't quite sure if some of the hits that Mia had managed to land in the early parts of the sparring wouldn't have ended the battle right there and then, had they not worn their protective gear. However, the contestants either didn't think so, or didn't care, since after shortly acknowledging the hit, they continued as if it hadn't happened. After a few minutes of the humans seemingly being pummeled, however, something changed. Rapree didn't immediately notice it, but the same could be said about his target. A loud smacking sound reverberated through the room, as the smooth surface of the human's thick gloves heavily collided with the Mia's face. Having landed his first good hit, the human dropped his guard for a moment and stepped forward to check on his opponent, who had stumbled back a step from the impact and was rubbing her presumably aching cheek. You okay? He asked with a surprised chuckle. Yeah, I'm fine, she answered nonchalantly, whereupon he rubbed the back of her head with the non-padded part of his glove. She leaned into the contact, for a moment touching the exposed part of his forearm with her forehead, and letting out a low, rumbling sound. After that, he stepped away again, and got back into position. Neither of them said anything. They just quietly shook out their limbs and licked their wounds, before he gringly stretched out one of his gloved hands towards her. She quickly tapped against with her own, then both of them immediately took back up their fighting stances. This next round, however, proceeded differently from the one preceding it. The speed advantage of the Miat had apparently vanished all of a sudden, and now the human could go on the offensive. And now that they were on more of an even footing, something else surprisingly became obvious. Even while on the offensive, rather than trying to hit the enemy, they were focusing a lot more on not getting hit. This seemed counterintuitive, as Rapig was fairly certain that, different from most people, those two could easily take some hits, if it meant they could quickly decide the fight in their favour. Instead, they danced around each other, keeping their distance and mostly fainting, trying to get their opponent to slip up, and only ever committing to an attack once they were sure their foe couldn't easily retaliate. Still, while they seemed very skilled, neither of them was perfect, and every now and then one made a mistake, allowing the other to capitalise on it. Here, the Mia had misjudged her distance while taking a swipe at the human's arm, and was rewarded with a punch in the gut for her trouble, after he had nimbly spun away from her movement, using his momentum to drive his fist into her abdomen. Then the human overstepped, as he was fought by one of the Mia's ruses, throwing a hard punch that hit nothing but air, while she twisted around his arm and landed what would have been a gruesome scratch along his face, but now instead rang out as a loud slap when her palm made contact with his cheek. With every heavy hit they landed, they stopped the fight for a moment, during which they made sure their enemy was alright, always showing some physical contact and combining it with some encouraging words and gestures before they got back into position. It was odd to say the least, seeing two killing machines constantly switching between being at each other's throats and cuddle time especially since one of them was known to be rather none too pleased about being touched. The proof of that was visible on the human's left arm to this day. After each of these peculiar pauses, the battle continued, and they acted as if they had gone on undisturbed. However, each time they started again, the situation was slightly different. Eventually, it became clear that after every pause, the human was gaining ground. Reprieve wasn't sure why that was, but it was undeniable. The hits landed by the Miat became fewer and farther in between, while he became more and more confident, now forcing her on the defensive. They went on like this for quite a while, making Reprieve wonder what in the galaxy they even needed to train for, seeing as being weighed down by what must have been nearly their own body weight didn't seem to even so much as tire them. But even their stamina apparently wasn't endless. Well, at least not that of one of them, because when nearly an hour had passed, the Miat finally raised her arms, giving the human pause. Once she saw that he had dropped his stance, her hands sank to her knees, and she panted heavily. The human, who wasn't breathing quite as heavily, smiled and, with some trouble, removed the cumbersome gloves, for which he had to clamp them between his arms and his body while pulling his hand out. Well, look who's all tuckered out, he said, and stepped over to his sparring partner to rub her back, while she was hunched over, seemingly having some trouble catching her breath. I will scratch you and it will hurt, she warned jokingly, 
pressing the words out between laboured breaths. The human laughed. Here, I remember, he responded, taking his hand off of her and now starting to also remove the weights that were still strapped to his body. Once he was done, he also helped her rid herself of the added cumbrance, which also allowed her to stand up straight again. While stretching her now unburdened muscles and gaining back control of her breathing, she commented, You're not normal, I swear. He laughed while shaking his head. Just got a lot of red muscles, he answered, and went over to grab two water bottles that they had prepared beforehand, quickly throwing one of them over to his partner before taking a drink. She caught it, now also laughing, and responded, I was thinking more in the direction of wires and bolts. For a moment it seemed that the human was thinking of something to say to that, but apparently decided to just laugh it off. Instead, he redirected the conversation, asking, So, you are done for today? She took a long drink before answering, holding up one finger, signalling him to wait. Yeah, I think I'll quit as long as I'm still able to walk out here by myself, she finally said, I wiped some residue water off her lips. What about you? He shrugged. I'll do some running and then also wrap it up for today, he replied, while he watched her gather up her equipment that lay strewn across the floor. All right, see you then, she answered, picking up her oversized wearable identifier and throwing it across her shoulder. Before he also picked his things back up, the human looked after her for a moment as she started to make her way out of the room. And that way led her directly through a prig. Not good. He pulled back his head, thinking about whether or not to hide somewhere, ultimately deciding against it and quickly trying to take up a more natural position. Only seconds later, the dark figure of the monster crossed the gate's threshold and stepped out into the hall. Immediately, her yellow eyes fell onto him, half leaning against the wall only a few paces away from her. She stopped in her tracks for a moment, eyeing him. He glanced over, inadvertently making eye contact with her for a moment. Her expression was wary, as her eyes focused on him as if in deep distrust, like an animal that was not yet sure whether or not it should tolerate his presence. He could feel his fur prickling, as it started to stand up under her continued gaze. His instincts told him that this situation was bad, and his brain screamed back at them that he knew that damn well himself. What could she possibly want? Then, as if a switch had been flipped, her disposition changed, with her eyes giving him a once-over, and her face displaying what Reprieve had learned to be macabre amusement. It's safe to go inside now, she finally spoke up, exposing one of her unnerving fangs in that horrendous gesture she had copied from the human. Don't worry, he's the nice one. With that, she turned to leave once more, her tail immediately waving through the air with each step as she sauntered away through the corridor. He breathed a sigh of relief. For a moment there, he thought that this would become a problem. Once the monster had disappeared from view, Rapri got back to work, retaking his position at the entrance. It would probably be a while until people noticed that the area was, once again, hospitable, so he would have to hold his position for a bit longer. The target had already put back on most of his weights, and was currently locked into what was a light job for him on one of the big treadmills, differing sizes and forms of which took up almost the entire back half of the room. Apparently on his homeworld, some running referred to crossing the entire damn plains of Quelroch, because an hour later, he was showing no signs of being at his limit. And while the feat itself certainly was impressive, watching him achieve it wasn't exactly thrilling. Doubts about the human having to be under constant surveillance at all times crept up on Reprieve. Maybe, sometimes, they could just trust that he was in fact doing what he said he would be doing. While he stood there, lamenting his lot in life, his attention drifted off, and lost in thought, he stopped watching his target and instead stared into space. When he realised that his eyes had been on the wall instead of on the human for quite some time already, he snapped back to reality, startled, and hastily tried to clear his mind and return his focus onto his mission. And as his eyes darted around the room, looking for the human who, to his shock, was not running on the treble anymore, they fell right onto said human's face, coming right towards him, and now also making eye contact. His first reflex was to quickly pull away and find a suitable hiding spot, but luckily he could suppress it. It was much too late for that now. All he could do was stand his ground after all. The human had no reason to find anything suspect about his presence. Yet still, for a second, Rapri couldn't help but feel that he saw something within the primitive's gaze. It was as sharp as he was used to from members of the revered order, and right now, it reminded him a whole lot of the look the captain always had in his face while scrutinising people that wished to gain his permission to come on board of his vessel. The dark horse peered into his own with the same understated aura of analysation and comprehension. 
Rodrigue admonished himself to, for goodness sake, not freeze up this time. He was just a crew member on his way into the fitness area. Nothing suspicious. Maybe his imagination had played a trick on him, however, because the human quickly broke the eye contact again, regarding Reprieve with no more than a quick greeting while crossing his way. And now, the usual song and dance would begin once more. At least moving along the halls remaining unseen by the target, as old as it may have gotten over time, was a good bit less boring than watching the target run in place forever. Expertly, he remained in the cover of all kinds of objects or crew members, his subconscious always selling him the next thing that would break the human's line of sight. In his education, Reprieve had learned that his species, in his infancy, had been hunted by large avian predators that had stood tall above the prairies of his home planet and relied almost solely on an incredible sense of sight, which caused his people to develop this ability. The predators had since been hunted to extinction, but the very useful skill of avoiding them was still within his metagenetic coding. With the human going on his little adventures as often as he did, the whole thing had become nothing but routine. And because it was a routine by now, Repri quickly felt that this time, something was off. He couldn't immediately put his finger on it, but something was different about how the human carried himself. An uncomfortable memory of his recent nightmare came up in the back of his mind, but he tried to ignore it. This was different. There was no unnatural darkness, and the ship wasn't suddenly abandoned. He could clearly see his target, and had plenty of places to hide. Also, the freak wasn't going insanely fast for no reason. If anything, he was moving slower than usual, probably because he was exhausted from the exercise he had just completed. Maybe that was what was throwing him off. An exertion like that must have left some traces on the guy, even if it wasn't obvious. Yes, that must have been it. But if it was only that, then why did Reprieve slowly get more and more of a sinking feeling that things were going wrong, and they were going wrong fast? He now paid close attention to the movements of the human, but there was nothing. He was confidently and calmly walking down his path. His posture was relaxed and he strolled leisurely. Overall, his body language gave no indication that he found anything amiss. And with that, realization hit Reprieg. It wasn't what he was doing. It's what he wasn't doing. All this time he had not turned around once, nor looked around once. He seemed to be paying no mind to his surroundings at all. What had happened to his attention to detail? The glances over his shoulder. The constant air of caution that was usually surrounding him at all times, threatening to reveal any and all who wished to seek something past him, and the Reprieve had to watch out for so many times. There was no trace of it, as if he was completely certain that there was nothing to be concerned about. If it were anyone else, that wouldn't be anything unusual. With a Freak, it just didn't fit. But still, here he was, apparently having not a care in the world. But why? Of all times, what was it that now gave him this confidence? While pondering this, a prickling sensation in the back of his mind brought with it another, much more unsettling idea. Maybe, just maybe, it wasn't that he was sure that he wasn't being followed. Maybe it was the exact opposite. Maybe there was no need to watch his back because even without looking, he knew exactly that he was being followed. Suddenly, while staring at the black hair on the back of the human's head, Reprieve didn't feel like he was covered anymore. But was that possible? Surely he was just imagining it. Still, even the idea alone was enough to have an interesting effect on his survival instincts. He still avoided the freak's line of sight, as he always did, but the feeling of being able to be seen never quite disappeared, even though he knew that there was no way the human could spot him. It was a weird sensation, as if there were eyes all around him, sending chill after chill down his back. It felt like an electric current, was constantly running through him, and another realization hit him. Humans had good eyes, yes, even excellent ones, but they didn't rely on them all the time. As far as he knew, most of their senses were at least up to par. That meant his cover wasn't nearly as reliable as it might have seemed. Despite that, the target would still have to be acutely aware of him in order to single him out amongst all the crew members crossing his path. Could that really be the case? And if so, how? Nervousness further built up inside Reprieve as he tried to wrap his head around the odd behaviour of the human. At this point, his tongue was more outside of his mouth than inside it, constantly wetting the tip of his trunk, while his ears fluttered around, trying to pick up on sounds that weren't there. Or were they? The feeling of being watched didn't disappear, and while the human's demeanour certainly didn't help with that, could it really be the sole reason? Well, 
If the human wasn't glancing over his shoulder every few steps, then maybe today it was Reprieve's turn to do so. It certainly would make him feel a bit better to have more of an eye on the surroundings, and the human wasn't going anywhere. Of course, there wasn't anything to be seen. He was just being ridiculous. Most likely he really was still shaken from that nightmare. Yet somehow he couldn't shake the thought of him losing his mind, as the primal fear of any species that came up under the threat of predation stretched out his cold arms towards him. Trying to calm his pounding heart, he took some deep breaths after he darted from behind a large technician into a doorway. The small pause didn't do him much good. Still, he soon had to reintegrate himself into the hallway's traffic if he didn't want to lose the target, despite his slow pace. By now they had entered a more populated part of the common area, which meant there was more of a crowd to disappear in, both for him and the freak. He took the first opening that presented itself. It was a group of cadets, apparently on their way back to their cabins, and chatting up a storm on the other side of the hall. Normally he would feel that this was too risky, since he would have to traverse a good bit of open space, but if he was going to fuss this much about the target not turning around, he might as well use it to his advantage now. While quickly crossing over to the opposite wall, he once again, just out of reflex, glanced over his shoulder. And suddenly, that feeling of eyes all around him made a lot more sense as he saw somebody who shouldn't have been there. Slowly prowling down the hall and currently staring him down, Petty Officer Shida, the monster herself, was coming his direction. Why was she here? Didn't she go back to her room just earlier? His mind started to race even faster than it already had, but he didn't have time to concentrate on that. No wanting to risk being shaken off by the human, he had to turn his attention away from the out-of-place predator. Tearing his eyes away from the feline, he directed them back forwards. It took him a second to find the man's small frame among the crew members, now all the while feeling another set of ice burning into the back of his head. The human still appeared to be tranquility personified, but now more than ever, Reprieve felt the air of menace that emanated from below that peaceful surface. More and more, the vague idea he had ridiculed before turned into something that he was all but sure of. Every single one of his ancestral instincts told him the same thing. He wasn't observing his target. He was the prey, and the hunters had already surrounded him. No way out. No chance to run. The human had managed to bait him and outsmart him, and all that without even looking. All he could do now was accept what would happen to him. Glancing back, he could only assume the position of the monster, who had by now disappeared behind much larger figures populating the room, just like he was doing. Of course, she had to still be there, but she apparently wouldn't give him the comfort of knowing her exact position. He wondered what they wanted from him. This seemed like a lot of work for nothing. If the human was aware of him being there, he could easily just turn around and confront him, and Reprieve wouldn't be able to do anything about it. Enlisting the help of another high-class death welder really seemed like overkill. Did he need to be concerned about his health? Maybe, but even then he was fairly certain that the human could do plenty of damage all by himself if he wanted to. So why in the galaxy was the monster sneaking after him? By all accounts it didn't make any sense. Whatever it was they wanted, he would soon find out, he realised, because by now his surroundings began to look familiar. They had just entered a new row of cabins, and in passing, Reprieve could see the number 114 on his right. If there was any consolation in his situation, it was that he, with his instincts being all but convinced he was about to be ripped to shreds by predators, had not time to think about what being discovered by his target would mean for his career. At least with Sheila being washed now, whatever happens to me won't go unnoticed, he knows he thought to himself, laughing inwardly. Or unpunished. The human's cabin was getting closer and closer, as the room numbers on his right slowly counted upwards. Even though he didn't want to, Reprieve kept glancing back, trying to locate the Miat, stalking him without luck. The cabin, 120, was already in view. It would only take seconds until the human reached it. Shortly before he did, movement in his periphery caused Reprieve to shoot his head sideways, his eyes landing directly on the monster, who had, seemingly out of nowhere, popped up right behind him. Her feral eyes constantly glanced around between him and the human, who had come to a halt before his cabin door. Reprieve could just about suppress a surprised yelp as the predator closed in on him while slightly cowering down. He didn't quite know what he expected her to do, but his screaming subconscious told him that the longer he could delay finding out, the better. And since she showed no signs of slowing down while walking up to him, he unwittingly kept stepping away from her, even if it meant neglecting his cover in the process. By now he was certain that he was useless anyway. Forcing himself to look away from the immediate threat, he pulled his eyes back forward, where they now had an unobstructed view of a freak. 
He stood at his door and had his eyes on the bioscanner while lowering his hand onto it. Then, as the door let out his signature sound had been unlocked, the human echoed it with a lethargic sight and finally looked up and right a reprieve. In that moment, trapped between the two deadliest beings on the entire ship, Rubrik made peace with whatever would happen next, all of his panic changing suddenly into a sense of peaceful apathy. While staring in his direction, the human crossed his arms and, still with the same lethargy in his voice, he loudly said, You know I can see you, right? What was that? Rubrik didn't understand. Of course he knew he could see him. Even if he had suspected that a human had noticed him during his observation, right now he wasn't hiding. He didn't know what to answer and just usually opened and closed his mouth. Behind him, he could hear movement. The monster came out of his shadow, running herself up in the process. She filled the air with some kind of amused sound while stepping past Reprieve, as if he wasn't even there. Then she answered, Well, it was worth a try. Reprieve could do nothing but stare at her, shell-shocked, and watch whatever was happening unfold. While both Death Worlders, instead of doing whatever he was sure they had planned for him, treated him like air. You're going to have to try a little harder than that, but I appreciate the effort, the human replied and let out a slight chuckle. So, how come you are here already? The address slowly walked over to him, again letting out the same sounds of amusement. I was wondering what in the galaxy was taking so long, she responded casually, while saying we are very closely to him. So, I was going to come check on you. Then I saw you already on your way and thought I might as well come along right away. Once she was done talking, she stretched out to try and rub her head against his, which she quickly avoided by pulling away. <laughs> Don't. I'm sweaty as all hell. He immediately excused himself, running two fingers along his glistening forehead as if to prove his point. I really have to shower. Turning towards the open door, he then lifted his left arm, signaling the woman to enter, and added, And since you're here, you can call over the others in the meantime. The master clicked with her tongue annoyedly, but didn't protest, as she entered the room followed by the freak who closed the door behind them, leaving Reprieg behind alone in the hallway. He stumbled a bit and had to support himself against the wall as his legs were giving up below him, while the realisation sank in. Had all of this really been his mind playing tricks on him as he first suspected? Was that even a possibility? It all felt so incredibly real. It took him multiple minutes before he was able to slowly drag himself away towards his own cabin. Once he had made it, he collapsed onto his bed. Could he really do this anymore? If a simple unexpected run-in with his target had given him nightmares, what was this going to do to his psyche? He could feel his entire body trembling, the stress hormones only slowly decaying within his bloodstream. Suddenly, a loud sound made him nearly jump out of his skin. His assistant was ringing. He thanked every deity that he didn't believe in that it wasn't the emergency ringtone designated for new assignments. Yet, he still felt trepidation, while trying to bring himself to answer, his finger trembling or hovering over the screen. Forcing himself to adhere to his responsible side, he finally answered with a soft, Yes? Out of the speakers rang the concerned voice of Hypha T. Hypha here, is everything alright? Not really, Reprieve answered, while trying to keep the quivering of his voice to a minimum. Today has been quite something. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Hyphati answered, sounding surprisingly genuine. I have some news, but they can probably wait if you aren't feeling up to it right now. Let's hear it, I can use the distraction. Reprieve answered honestly and shifted around on his bed, trying to make himself at least somewhat comfortable. Well, we're back in comms range, Hyphati related, apparently trying to sound factual, but not quite managing to quell her worried tone. I've already made contact and given the first report about the situation and... She paused there. It didn't seem like one of the dramatic pauses she loved to randomly build into her sentences either. What about it? Repeat pride, wondering what could stun Hyphati of all people into silence. Slowly, she answered. Well, we've got new orders back. Not much is changing for us personally, but with things going as they have been, well... She had to take a calming breath before finishing her sentence. Command decided that it would be better to take a more direct approach in the future.